of various meetings. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Alderperson Reinke, seconded by Alderperson Vitale for approval. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, next item on the agenda is discussion relative to procedures to update the city zoning ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve? Um, before I begin, I just want to introduce uh, formally to everyone here um, the two faces of the planning division. We've got Dale Jill Gregory, to my right, and to my right, and then also Katie Bennett. Um, so both of them uh, and myself comprise the planning division team uh, within the development department, and we're really happy to have them on board. They bring a lot of expertise and knowledge, and uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to working that into our Hopefully, our zoning ordinance update. So now maybe um, we know where Jill came from. Sure. Katie, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your Mrs. little background or your what sure. your experiences. So I'm originally from Michigan, and I have my undergraduate degree in urban planning from Michigan State. And I worked for many years for county level government while I was in Michigan. Uh, first in Flint, and then in Ann Arbor. And after that, I joined the Peace Corps. So I was in Moldova for two years. And then from there, I decided to go back to graduate school, which is how I ended up in Wisconsin to go to UWM. Got my master's in urban planning as well as a master's in public administration. Great. And now I'm here. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So um, we've prepared a little PowerPoint presentation um, for you this evening. And the point of our, I guess, our, our update here is to bring ourselves into modern times on the eve of the re big reveal of our new brand of the city. Um, we think it's also important to take a look at um, what we're currently using as our zoning ordinance. And while there have been various changes over the years, over the past 20 or so years, they've been sort of smaller scale changes that haven't really been comprehensive uh, overall in nature. So it's, it's time, I think, to, um, we feel it's time at least, to take a, a broader look, a more comprehensive look at our zoning ordinance, bring it into the, the current century, um, reduce the sort of level of antiquated language that we're using. Um, it's very listy. So we've got lists of permitted uses, lists of special uses. It's organized into um, sort of the traditional Euclidean or like pyramidal type of zoning um, where, you know, what's permitted in um, a, a greater district is also permitted back in sort of a, the origin, original origin of the district. So it's very, it's very lengthy. It's, it's a number of pages. Uh, it's, it's, you think I meant to bring one down here tonight, and I forgot to do so, but I'm happy to show you the hard copy version of it. We also have it online, but you know, I don't think anybody's ever asked for a hard copy of our zoning ordinance in the past probably five or 10 years, I and mean, it's been it's very limited. Most everybody uses the online version right now that we have, but even that is, is a little clumsy to use, and there have been updates in terms of best practices um, in, in sort of organizing um, the way we the way we look at information into more more so like tables, charts, visuals, diagrams, illustrations, which we would recommend be incorporated into the new format of a zoning ordinance for the city of West Dallas. So, what's happening? What we currently have is, um, as it says here, difficult to um, to understand in many cases. Um, we get a lot of calls for service throughout the year. In the past year alone, about 4,500 calls just to the planning division alone. And uh, many of those are for zoning ordinance questions. What can I do with my property? How can I develop this? How tall can my building be? Can I put, a, can I put an addition on my, my building? And a lot of these things can be answered pretty easily with, with an updated code um, without that need to call the staff. I mean, we're open for business. We're welcome to take those calls. But we like to sort of improve our front line of uh, communication online where, where people are going to take a look at information first and if they still don't understand it then they end up calling us but I think we can do a better job with our online version of the code and just the basic format of it so um, so it just sort of uh, re re reiterating what I just mentioned but you know just being more user friendly business friendly we got a lot of people that call us for questions and it's not just the citizens but it's uh, you know uh, I guess elected officials as well other cities sometimes and we also get a lot of calls from the business community and developers wanting to know what they can do, sort of projecting a future of, uh, of, of, their, you know, of their property in West Dallas or their use in West Dallas. Um, 
visuals and um, you know best practices, uh, including you know eliminating unnecessary language, defining certain terms. We have a lot of dated terms in our in our ordinance. Um, you know, we're using cocktail lounges. You have taverns and cocktail lounges, department stores, uh, video sales, trophy sales. A lot of those things can be sort of melted down a little bit into more user-friendly and better defined categories of, of use, um, rather than trying to list every possible scenario under the sun like we currently try to do, and it's, it's not effective. Um, so uh, the, the, the broad vision here is to improve um, the planning and development process, to improve the quality of applications we receive for special uses, and um, maybe taking a look at the special uses that we have currently in the city. And um, why do we consider these special uses? Do they create noise? You know, are there certain uh, effects that they create? I mean, there's certain things that we could probably take out of special use categories. There's maybe some other things that we haven't thought of that we, we may want to have as special uses. So um, there's, there's different things that will help us um, improve upon what we currently have and uh, increase our performance and effectiveness to optimize uh, the, the zoning. So what Jill and Katie are going to get into uh, next, uh, Jill uh, will, will follow uh, my introduction here and then Katie will uh, follow that, uh, but some of the, the basic elements or options, if you will, um, within our code that we like to um, uh, offer to you for consideration, things that we feel are going to be very important are going to be uh, just general language updates, you know, eliminating the ambiguous terms, the old, um, the old and ambiguous terms, and, and coming up with a new, um, uh, new use instead of listing them out, to incorporate those into charts and add visual aids such as illustrations, perhaps even some photographs, um, diagrams to help again visualize what we're trying to say within the ordinance. Um, we're also we also want you to consider an additional industrial uh, district. Right now we just have one industrial or manufacturing zoning district within the city. We think it's important to have two to differentiate between light and heavy. Right now it's just all lumped into a one district and it's going to have a heavy, you know, zoning type of uh, manufacturing use such as like perhaps a unit drop forge or motor castings right across the street from residential. Now while that was sort of dealt to us by just traditionally through our origins of the city and how we grew, um, in the future, I think we want to take a look at um, introducing a new zoning district where we're going to put the majority of our new uh, heavy uses that maybe come to us over the, over the future years, and then the lighter ones could be compatible with residential and commercial zoning um, to reduce those edge conflicts. Um, and another consideration will be a form-based code. Um, now, we're not saying for the entire city, uh, but perhaps maybe for certain areas of our city. It could be used as a, perhaps like an overlays district, um, maybe in our downtown area, in the 70th to 76th Street Greenfield area. That might be a nice area to consider a form-based type of zoning ordinance um, for our downtown. And it would be a specific, where, where most of the zoning ordinance that we currently have is use-based, this would be more in terms of maintaining that traditional Main Street type of uh, environment, built environment we have in the downtown right now. Um, the, the minimal setbacks, the parking <coughs> behind the buildings, the, the form of the streetscape. Um, uh, while uses would still be part of the discussion in the downtown, um, it would be more focused on the form and maintaining what we currently have downtown and trying to avoid uh, you know, just these large, vast parking lots with buildings set back 400 feet from the street frontage. Um, so. And then lastly, um, an interactive um, online mapping capa uh, capability or compatibility. We want what we're seeing in the zoning ordinance to be perhaps even mappable, where when a, when a developer comes and inquires about where can I put my business or can I develop this, they can do a quick query online and it's going to generate locations on a map based on their query where they can where they can locate their business. So we feel those are the basic elements or options that our zoning ordinance should have. And we're going to develop these. We're going to develop uh, ultimately a scope of services that we would present to you and seek your approval on that. So you'll have, there's no, I guess, no ultimate decision tonight, but I mean, what we're asking for is your consideration of these elements, and we would definitely bring back an update, a scope of services for you guys to consider. So I'll turn it over to Jill next. Thanks. Uh, so I have the first one here. It's reviewing and updating the language. So we'd like to make it more clear, consistent, 
relevant and simplified. As Steve alluded to, the code right now is not very user friendly. It's hard to navigate and really understand what it's saying in plain language. Uh, so for an example, we have some uh, duplicate categories. These are currently in our code, so we have a listing for curtain and drapery sale um, and home furnishing separately. Those are really the same thing, um, causing confusion. Obsolete terminology such as hosiery, millinery, um, I don't think that's relevant today. <laughs> Some ambiguous terms such as medical office versus medical clinic, uh, probably very close to the same. And establishing consistency for special use classification. So currently we have uh, candy stores and ice cream stores listed as a special use, where other types of food stores, including meat markets, are permitted use. That seems about the opposite, or maybe they should be um, in the same category one way or the other. And then also simplifying language. So currently, as an example, um, in our code, the definition for floor area ratio, I'm not going to read that. It's long and hard to understand for the average person. Um, that can be simplified into something that floor area ratio equals gross floor area divided by your total lot. Very simple, plain language, easy to understand versus our long-winded paragraph. Uh, with helping that, incorporating some user-friendly elements such as tables and visuals like Steve was, was talking about. So here's some examples of that, that type of thing, how our code could be better. So reorganizing our regulations into tables. Um, currently we have everything listed by, by district, which isn't a bad way to go, uh, but it's all in a lot of long lists. So it's difficult to find what you're looking for. You have to refer back and forth to different sections, and it's difficult to compare one district to the next. And this is the same for staff as well as developers or residents um, looking back and forth between the code. So an another example where this can be problematic, um, maybe a business calls, or they're, they're looking in the code first and they're trying to figure out uh, maybe I want to put a shed in my rear yard. I know I'm in a C4 district, but you know, what's what's my setback? What can I do? I'm not really sure. I'm just going to I'm going to try to figure this out on my own without calling the city. Um, so they're going to scroll past all the districts. Um, they're going to get to C4, which you got to go through residential C1, C2, C3 to C4. You're going to go down, you're going to find rear yard, and then it's going to say same as required in C2. So then you're going to scroll back up through C4, back up through C3, everything into C2. You're going to somehow, these are snippets, but when you scroll through the code, it's a lot of text. Um, you're going to maybe someday find this yard requirements, side and rear. I'm, I'm going to read this so you can hear it. <laughs> there shall be a 10 foot setback from any side or rear lot line abuts a lot located in a residential zoning district or a lot in a commercial zoning district used for two for single or two family dwelling and such use is not a conforming use. I have no idea what that says. <laughs> maybe it's 10 feet, maybe it's not, I'm not I'm sure. Now, yep, now I'm gonna pick up the phone and call the city and, and staff is gonna have to figure this out. Um, and as staff, I'm gonna need to read that a couple times to see what it's, what it's really saying. So an example, putting this in a table, um, the, the same type of situation, if, this is a little different categories than what we have, but as a commercial, if you're an, an SRB, you're gonna go down here, SRB, right over, rear yard and feet, 30 feet. That took 20 seconds. Much simpler if you can see it in a table. Um, maybe if you were trying to compare different setbacks or different um, uses, you can see everything right next to each other in a table where in our code you'd be scrolling back and forth and finding those sections in different areas. Uh, this is currently what our permitted uses looks like in C2. Um, we have it scrunched in one slide as, <laughs> as nicely as possible. When you're reading it on a screen, it's just one gigantic list. Um, it's not laid out the greatest either as things have been added to these, this permitted use list. It's not necessarily in alphabetical order. 
Um, for an example, I, I've noticed this one in the past. Uh, if I'm maybe an art gallery that wants to open up in town, if you start over here at the beginning and you look down in A and then B, art gallery is not here. So now I'm wondering what else could you be calling a a, an art gallery? Maybe I scroll down to G, something in gallery. Nope, not there. I'm going to scroll through this whole thing. For some reason, art gallery is listed as the very last item under permitted uses. I'm not sure why. And then you also have to, <laughs> and then also special uses is listed before that. Um, as an example that I don't have a visual for because it's, it's not really possible to put in a slide, if you're an, um, maybe looking to open a business and you're looking at a site that's a C4, let's say, and you want to know if your, um, your art gallery is permitted in a C4, what you're going to do is scroll through all the permitted uses in a C4, all the special uses in a C4, you're not going to find it. It's going to say, well, permitted uses are we all, and a C4, you can also use C3. So you're going to scroll through C3, permitted and special. You're not going to find it there either, but it will say, well, refer back to C2. You can also use all the permitted uses in C2. So then you're going to scroll through C2. It also won't be in alphabetical order. You will maybe find it here sometime. So that's currently what, what you have to do. Um, they're going to call the city before dealing with that. <laughs> so the same type of situation. Um, here it's listed in a table. This is a snippet from Wauwatosa. Uh, they have things listed in categories with subcategories. So here is an example of animal services. has items like sales and grooming, shelter and boarding, and veterinary. So if I'm a, a veterinary clinic and I'm looking to come into West Dallas, I want to know where I'm permitted. I can see in a table anywhere from there C0 to M2 is a permitted use for a veterinary clinic. That's easy. <laughs> uh, visuals can also clarify terms and definitions, provide examples, reference major features, increase readability and understandability. So as you're looking at a, at a illustration like this, you can see with a definition exactly what those items are referring to. Um, so an example of that again, to the left is our current code. It's a long list of definitions. Um, if you're looking at something again, like, well, what's my, what's my rear setback really mean? Um, you're going to have to read through, these, through the definitions and then hopefully understand that. Um, on the right side here, if you have a visual that shows you what a rear setback is along with a definition that states what a rear setback is, that's easier to understand. I can also clarify more technical terms. So here's the floor, floor area ratio example again. Um, if you can see that with a couple illustrations that state, well, this is floor area ratio at 100%. Well, it covers the entire lot. Here's 50%. Go up two stories. 25%, you're going to go up four stories, you know, covering 25% of the lot. That's easy to understand. I can also provide some real life examples. Um, Here's one with photographs that's referring to building types. So this would be helpful to developers to uh, give the city clear and, and well-made um, proposals. Currently, it's, we, our design standards aren't necessarily that easy to understand uh, right off the bat. So if, you, if, you, if we can show them real-world examples of even places in, in West Dallas, um, that's easier to understand. So for this one, uh, for example, they have a cottage retail building type. It's meant to be adjacent to residential districts, so the buildings kind of look like houses. So it fits into the neighborhood better. And that's easily seen with a couple photos. Uh, illustrations are also nice for pointing out um, different types of design features with not only your text to describe what you're referring to, but then an illustration with, you know, exactly what that means. So if you're talking about, um, for example, number three here, if you look and you're like, oh, I'm not really sure what that's referring to. Well, it's it's that the building facade requires a minimum of 15% um, transparent glass on the upper floor. Oh, I see exactly what they're talking about here. They they need 50 15 percent. Um, transparent windows on upper level retail buildings in this district. 
so those types of features can make the code a lot easier um, to understand for residents, developers, as well as staff um, to give clear and concise answers. And then Katie's going to talk about the last two. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the more modern best practices that are out there that we're not really taking advantage of in our code, um, and also talk about the compatibility with online zoning. Um, so the two, can, the two best practices that we'd like to discuss tonight are the inclusion of a light industrial mixed use zone within the city, um, and the potential for using form-based code in our downtown area. Starting with the, the light industrial mixed use, uh, as Steve said, we currently only have one, one manufacturing district, the M1, um, and this, this is really focused on the traditional concept of manufacturing, large production, large plots of lands, separated from other uses, not very walkable areas of the community, um, or in the instances where maybe they, they are near residential areas, uh, conflicting with, with those homes, um, thinking about a single family home next to a really large industrial facility that has a lot of noise, maybe air pollution, or um, lots of large equipment on their property that really diminishes the value of the, of the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and so while this type of industry is still needed and um, is certainly important to the economy, it is not the full picture of manufacturing today. And we think that two industrial zones uh, should be considered for, for West Dallas. Um, manufacturing has been changed by technology and so light manufacturing today is often much smaller scale, lower impact, it's cleaner, um, and oftentimes they sell directly to the people that they're, um, directly to consumers rather than to other industries. So things like small tech startups, uh, artisan food production, breweries, um, and a lot of other local makers market type of uh, businesses. And so these type of businesses uh, often require not only the production space, but somewhere where they can sell their goods to customers, uh, maybe some office space, potentially research, research and development space. And they're very compatible with you know, restaurants, residential areas, the whole work, live, play type of vibrant neighborhood um, that is you know, desirable. So these are just some pictures um, to kind of showcase that uh, light manufacturing really just needs kind of a small storefront with some retail space, that production space, um, and, that it and that it can fit into these more walkable, vibrant, um, traditional type of neighborhoods. So I'm not sure why we use Tosa so many times, but <laughs> another <laughs> snippet from Tosa. Uh, to, to again show that it is very common to distinguish between these two types of industry and if you look at their, even in their definitions, they speak to this issue of, you know, light industrial um, has few, if any, visual or operational impacts on the surrounding community, whereas heavy industrial should be separated away from residential uses because of the impacts that they could have on those areas. And so when we look at our own future plan for land use in the city, um, you can see in the purple that is intended to be mixed use development, but that mixed use development does not include any type of manufacturing, including light industrial. Um, so it's really eliminating what could potentially be uh, good spots for new businesses from going into those areas. Uh, similarly, the, the red is commercial um, and with the declining trends in, in the retail market, um, perhaps some of those might also be ideal spaces for having the type of light manufacturing business, businesses to locate there. And so, you know, what we wanna do in updating the code is really have an opportunity to actually analyze this type of stuff, to think about where would this fit into our community? Do we want it in our community? Um, and if we do, where should it go? And then the other practice that Steve referenced is form-based code, which um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this. It is a very you know, 
technical planning term, I would say. Not at all. Yeah, that's, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go over that very briefly. There's a lot to it, so this is a quick overview. But essentially, traditional zoning, which is how our community is planned and how most communities have been planned, um, organizes everything based on how the building is being used. So if it's a residential building, a commercial building, an industrial building, etc. cetera. Um, and what this has resulted in is a clear distinction between where all these things are. Uh, so very single use districts. This is only commercial, only residential, only industrial. Uh, typically has had limited design standards and the focus is on each individu individual parcel. Um, Form-based coding is a much more holistic approach and it takes into consideration um, either a given street or a neighborhood depending on how you would like to structure it. Um, it encourages a greater mix of uses and the emphasis is on architecture and public spaces and how it feels when you're on the street. Um, so use is still a factor but it's not the dominant factor. So with traditional zoning, um, a downtown neighborhood like this may be uh, regulated under their commercial district regulations. Um, and at the same time, a big box store may also be regulated under commercial. And so these two spaces obviously have a very different feel. Um, and so what form-based code looks to do is to move away from regulating in this way and to really regulate based on character. So um, what do you want the character of your town or neighborhood to feel like? So when we think about this for West Dallas, we're definitely not thinking about this as the whole city. Um, that would be a really, really big undertaking. But we do think it could be really valuable in the downtown um, so that as redevelopment happens over time, we can really control and maintain the existing character um, and, not, and not lose that, um, that, that sense of, of downtown. And so this example here is, um, just shows that, again, they try to uh, regulate based on what the, the character of, of the area is. So here they broke it down by urban, small town, and rural. Um, but uses are also recognized, so residential, commercial, um, in, in this example. So ours would probably be, if we were just focusing on the downtown, it'd be more, what would we want our urban commercial character to look like? And so some of the benefits of doing these types of updates is that it makes it really easy in the future to um, use online mapping tools. So this part that I'm about to present isn't actually part of the update itself but it would more naturally follow after the fact um, once the update was complete. So online zoning maps essentially link your zoning code to an interactive map and they help answer questions um, of, you know, like where can my business be located and what can I do with my property very easily. Like the average person can come on and very easily find answers to these questions. Um, it's more efficient and transparent it reduces confusion and uh, removes barriers to development that often exist. However, in order for this to be an effective tool, our code needs to be really clear, really consistent. So the city of Oak Creek, for example, uses a program called Zoning Hub. Uh, Zoning Hub is just one of many uh, applications that are out there. It's, not the, it's definitely not the only choice. There's lots of options. Um, but for the sake of this presentation, I'll just run through what it might look like for someone trying to open a business in Oak Creek. So if uh, they would go and click on, I want to know where I can put my business. And then when they click on that, it will take them to a map of the city that has all the land uses identified. Um, so, okay, my business is a commercial business. And now I'm going to see all the commercial business options listed in alphabetical order um, right there. And so if, uh, again, we're trying to open an art gallery, I'll click on the art gallery, and then we will see every parcel in the city where we are permitted to open an art gallery. And from here, you can click on any individual parcel and get parcel-specific information uh, that you might need. So 
these are really valuable tools that make it really easy for anyone to come on and look at and say, you know, I want to put my business here. How does it work? What are my options? Um, but it won't be an effective tool unless our, unless our code is, is an effective tool. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. So just to wrap things up, um, uh, the, the zoning ordinance is, in many cases, um, you know, what, what a lot of I mean, people that we deal with and what we deal with on a daily basis. Um, so improving it is, I think, overall going to help us um, uh, I guess achieve better clarity with our audience. Um, so we've got a combination of citizen users and, and then also uh, uh, more technical users, such as developers, engineers, and, and business people. But um, so uh, to go over many of the questions that uh, Katie and Jill just answered, um, each of these users has specific needs, and a new um, updated zoning ordinance would help us better address our, uh, the needs of the, of the people that are they're calling us and asking us questions. So, and the um, the update to the zoning ordinance will also align with our um, city strategic vision. Um, we feel, in terms of the image, brand, and destination, strategic goal one, it, it's going to improve the modern and make forward thinking uh, city planning and, and development process improving the quality of applications that we receive. Um, it's going to improve the quality of life. It's going to be a more holistic approach to dealing with the planning and health of our uh, the city and its future. And in terms of uh, strategic goal four, improving economic development, um, the business people we deal with, the people that are thinking about choosing West Dallas as a destination, as a home. This is going to be a great um, frontline tool to, to, help, to help those people out. Um, and then ultimately improving the government service, the way we communicate with each other, um, um, you know, the older persons, uh, the staff, uh, the mayor, all of us just having better base of knowledge and ease of access to get to that knowledge quicker and faster. It's going to help us deliver a better product to our, to our customers. So, um, so uh, again, just in, in recap, these are the priorities that, we've, that uh, Katie and Jill have, have outlined in the presentation. We feel that um, you know these are the, the basis for what we would like to update within our within our zoning ordinance, um, and sort of as far as how do we get there, um, we're going to be uh, with your with your permission. I guess we'd like to put together a more detailed scope of services, and we can review that with you when that's complete. We can come back at a, a separate meeting and seek common council approval ultimately of that scope of services. Um, with that in hand, and with that directive in hand from the council, then. We could uh, obtain cost estimates, um, you know, from uh, consultants, and uh, and then review those cost estimates with you. The cost estimates we, re we would receive would be broken down by by item, by line item, in terms of those options that we presented to you. You could take a look at those and how much each one of those is going to cost, and choose if that's do you want all of them or do you want maybe part of them. And uh, I guess that's. That's what we're asking you to be tonight. So I think, I, I think uh, yeah. <coughs> the entire council's on board with updating the zoning ordinance. I mean, I think it's been needed. We're all aware of that for quite a while. Um, I guess my question would be, what's the timeline? Well, I mean, as far as uh, putting together a scope of services, I mean, we could do that probably in the next. All the way down. I'd like to oh, see a timeline. Okay. All right. We can do that. Absolutely. So we know if it's going to take us six months, a year, two years, ten years. Right. Unfortunately, things <laughs> have dragged out on, in the past on some various items. Sure. I want to make sure that we're on schedule and going to stay on schedule yeah. on something like this. That's I, a, know, I think yeah. it's very important. Yeah. By, by the next council meeting, we'll have a schedule to present to the Safety Development Committee, Good. and they'll show you how we're going to, what we're going to do and how we're going to get there. Great. Thank you. And so then we'll, ultimately, we'll have that uh, that schedule online, and you'll be able to just click in and check it to see where we're at. Then you'll know so where we're at. If you have any questions, then you can give us a call. Great, uh, Steve. I know for 25 years already, you know, heavy manufacturing has been the yeah. trend. Mm -hmm. It's been changed within our city. So, say 20 years from now, what really would happen with? I mean, I, I agree with all, all the years you guys put yeah. forward. Yeah, that's, I think that's good for the uh, city for the future. But let's say 20 years from now, so we have a, some land which somebody said, well, I want to put heavy manufacturing here. So what would be the incurrence uh, at that time, you know, if it happens? 
Well, I mean, with our comprehensive plan, I mean, the, the land use plan, the comprehensive plan for 2030 does guide our, our future. That's kind of our crystal ball, our, our, our guide. And that gu it's a guide. I mean, it can be changed. Um, it's, that's, that's not a, a permanent thing. So that, solid. that does yeah. get updated, too, from time to time over the years. So, I mean, we'll be continually taking a look at that. And we're going to be making an update on that, too, as well. Um, but we want to get the zoning done first. But we are going to be updating our comprehensive plan to take a look at those 26 or 28 redevelopment areas we, we looked at back in 2010. A lot of those we've, we've accomplished a great deal of those items over the past, you know, number of years, so eight years or so. Uh, but we'll be taking a look at that and creating, coming up with some new, some new opportunities, new redevelopment areas within the city that we'll be taking on next and um, evolving with the trends as well. Um, you know, the whole retail uh, to online thing is happening right now. Um, it's a trend. Um, what the next trend is down the road from that, we'll find out. <laughs> and, you know, and, and a lot of it is sort of an evolution, and, yeah. and you just you roll with it, and you stay connected with your, with the people, your public, and your peers, and um, yeah, we work together to, Thanks. to plan the next, the next big thing. Right. Once we do get the new zoning ordinance updated, we'll be continuously updating it uh, as we move along. As, as things change, we're, we'll still be coming back and changing things, so it's not going to be uh, a static document either. So it'll be. Move it constantly. Should be. Yeah. Mr. As the economy changes, so will we. All person ranking. Oh, I, I commend you. It's an excellent plan. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that every council member will support it very definitely. Um, I like the idea of the division of the industrial into two. That's excellent also. Uh, the form based downtown, the form based downtown area uh, was different rules I take it you'll have for downtown that also is a plus uh, I'm just impressed it's it's a long time coming <laughs> yeah I mean I agree as well too I mean someone that lives you know, very near downtown I feel like our downtown still is stuck in Alice Chalmers and it's mm -hmm. it's cold it's uninviting and it, it needs to be the main street that it should be and it should look like, you know, the cute bungalows that are right off, you know, off of Greenfield Avenue. And it should be inviting and we should, it should not be so many <laughs> cigarette stores and tobacco stores. Um, I, I, I use um, downtown Racine as an example because I was living down there when they went through the Main Street change. And, you know, <coughs> granted, it was a lot of Johnson money that assisted in a lot of that stuff. Um, but when you drive down Main Street in Racine, you are you go from the downtown district and you go in to the the cute homes that follow the district follow the downtown district as well too, and vice versa, going from the, the nice cute homes through downtown. And I really would love to see that happen on Greenfield Avenue. So and this is great. Good. Any other comments from any uh, council? Alderman Main. I've been saying for a while we need an M1 and an M2. I've been bugging about it for <laughs> two or three years. If we could take that care of that by the end of the year even, I'd yeah. be excited. And I think that might even tie into the next topic about pilots and certain properties. Mm -hmm. and I'll save those comments for then. Very Thank good. you. Thank you. Very encouraging. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you all. Okay. Next item on the agenda is a discussion relative to reviewing the city's current payment in lieu of taxes or pilot policies. <laughs> <laughs> and Patrick, do you know any of the uh, we, you we have, uh, we just want to have an opportunity to have a discussion of this in a generic sense, not mm -hmm. any particular property or business, but historically we have been using uh, pilots not as a quid pro quo, which would be illegal to be able to do, uh, but if a company wants to volunteer, they want to offer a pilot, we will take into consideration, and that's what we've been doing in the I, past. I think, John, for the sake of the fact that we're on TV, and I think the television audience may not understand what a pilot is, it's a payment in lieu of taxes whereby tax-exempt uh, entities want to locate in the city, they would not normally have to pay taxes, but through negotiations of something, uh, uh, they agree that they will pay a fee in lieu of taxes. Um, and uh, I think Aurora Hospital is, is one example of that. 
good, good point. Uh, the word pilot comes from payment in lieu of taxes, and uh, that's what I'm glad you brought brought that up. Uh, West Dallas has been historically been using approximately 40 percent. Usually, we call it the city's <laughs> portion of the property tax bill uh, for the private nonprofit entities that have been doing that. There's been a lot of discussion recently, uh, most notably in the village of West Milwaukee, uh, where they've gone to 100 percent of pilot payment. And so I know some of the aldermen have been talking about should we change our existing unofficial policy to a different policy. And then there's been some discussion also of what if you went to 100% payment, do you share it with other tax jurisdictions? Do we keep that? How do you, how's that all going to deal too? So it's not to, to end that debate, it's to start that debate and to try to figure out where you want us to be so that when we're working with these entities, we can make a suggestion to them uh, based on what a realistic expectation might or might not be. That's why we're bringing it up. John, do you have any information on what other communities around the state do? Just about every state, every city does pilots. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's across the board. It's they, What do you mean across the board? They, they use either the city's portion so it's all different, all over the map. It's all over the map. There isn't any consistency <laughs> as to how some don't do, for the Zeta City of Milwaukee, doesn't do any at all. They do zero pilots. So it's, there isn't a precedent okay. to follow. So the most common is the, the, um, the city's portion, and that's what we've been doing, and I forgot how many we have. Six. 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 And so over the years, we have six currently in effect. So when somebody asks me or Patrick or Sean, uh, if the city do pilots, and if you do, how do you calculate it? What do we say? That's our question here. What do you want us to say? Mr. Chair, All person right basically here. I think the aldermen are getting frustrated because a lot of our large box stores that have moved out uh, and that are empty now are coming in with nonprofit organizations and they obviously don't want to pay any taxes. So I'm, I'm wondering are there any that come to us that basically um, refuse to pay any pilot, you might say? Well, Alderman Reinke, I'll, I'll remind you that it is illegal for us to to go and demand that they do a pilot. I understand that. So, or you have some place like um, the Goodwill store that vacated and the church moved in. Right. That's a private transaction right. that we can do nothing about. And, and a lot of these are just private transactions. I think what Mr. Stiebel is talking about is where you have um, a, a nonprofit that wants to move into an area and maybe says, um, I want assistance from the city. Maybe I need it to be rezoned. Um, uh, maybe we need some some sort of concessions on something made, uh, or we want to work with the city to uh, change uh, um, the zoning on uh, or, or a special use or something on on it, where we have or even uh, financing or yeah, or financing, whatever, whatever, whatever. Right. where we have some kind of uh, um, ability to say no, no, we're not going to do that to them, um, and and they then say, well, what if we decide we're going to pay taxes? Would you consider it then? Then we may want to consider it and under those circumstances then do we say we want you to pay for not only the city of West Dallas but the school district MATC the sewage district the county and all of those taxes and 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 make everyone whole on what that would normally be assessed at or what we've been doing is just saying well, you have to pay us the city portion so that's that's what the kind of information John is and staff are looking for what kind of direction as a council do we want to give them right i realize it's a sensitive process yes it is mm -hmm. very and, and and you know it's because we're not allowed by state right i understand that well myself really i mean uh, it should be uh, some way that a makeable approach you know, to uh, try to get some kind of uh, Agreements or some kind of uh, money, you know. To uh, I, I know it's like you said, I mean, it's kind of illegal, you know, to uh, 
pursuing that direction, but you think it's something approachable? I, I look at it as to what services are we providing yeah. to these entities. And we're certainly providing police That's and fire, right. Um, public fire, works, the snow yeah. plowing, all of those city services, yes. and that's why we've been charging the city fee. Now, you know, uh, the school district, are, are they, they're not, I don't know that the school district is providing directly services to these, maybe indirectly through vocational school or something, MATC might, um, through that type of thing. Um, same thing with the, with the county, um, I, I, you know, and, and the school district certainly so you know, you, you look at these and you say, what, what, what is really right in asking um, a nonprofit to to help contribute to pay? What are the, what services are they getting for the dollar? You know that they're going to be spending because you know, I, I think we want to be fair to these people and and charge them what you know is is equitable and fair to everybody across the community. But uh, you know, I don't want to be also charging them for services that they're not using. Right. I don't think that's fair. Uh, that's been the historical rationale that we've used on the current pilot payment yeah. process is that you, at a minimum you're using, you're driving the streets, you're calling 911, you're yeah. using water, uh, would you mind helping us pay for those? And that's kind of what we try to have been encouraging. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Stiebel, uh, how has that been working out for us so far? Generally, uh, well, we've got six, I guess. It's, we don't get a lot of opportunities to have to add this into question, but it's not a really big ticket item, a hot item. Uh, it's it's nice to uh, see some of these other entities helping that nonprofits provide some financing to, to the city, particularly if we provide like financing or something like that. To, we've done something proactive for them. It certainly helps, but. Uh, uh, it's always a voluntary issue and nothing that we could require or compel and we try to avoid doing that and you know there are a heck of a lot of tax exempt properties in this city mm -hmm. I don't know Peggy if you know how many offhand probably not I don't but, but I there's a calling Pete Daniels um, special assessment here yeah. when he tells you yep a large like it's a large number or something of it, the land area right exempt. So, you know, we are providing services to a lot of tax exempt properties without getting any taxes or pilot from them. Mr. Chair, I've been to many conventions at the League of Municipalities and they broach this subject endlessly. And there's basically, it sounds like there's really nothing we can do because the law isn't on our side. But I certainly would support you continuing to uh, approach these businesses with what how you've been doing it currently uh, the services they use I think they should they should really be paying for it. I realize that however if we can um, do it as you have been doing it uh, I would support that follow me man yeah, so I'm looking at this from, a, from another perspective. Of course, we'd like to see the city portion paid for, but when you look at the, the West Dallas taxpayer, the entity, the other entity that's going to be greatly impacted by these sorts of things is going to be the school district. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the MMSD, the county, things like that, if they don't get a payment in lieu of taxes, the impact is very minor to a taxpayer here. But the, the service to uh, those in the school district um, is either going to drop or the school district takes a hit, which affects the, again, the level of service that's provided. And so I'd, I'd push for city and schools um, to be collect enough for that, for both entities, to help our taxpayers. And like you share the money with the schools then too. Yes, share, absolutely, yep. yes. I, I think we should be looking at 100%. Because if you look at uh, uh, other businesses, Yes, they're for profit businesses, but they're not sending anybody to school districts, and, and they're not doing a lot of the same things that these businesses would be doing. So, that, so it should be a, a, a even playing field on that level, because uh, nonprofits gets a lot of uh, benefits the other way. But my problem with with the pilots is what uh, legal. Uh, 
hammer do we have that after a few years, they say, well, we can't afford to pay this anymore, we're not paying. How legally can we say, well, you made an agreement with us, we changed the zoning for you, you know, you have to do that. What's the legality? We didn't, <clears throat> we can't do it like that. We can't, we changed the zoning. It's a separate, although sometimes simultaneous negotiation. It's not legal to have a quid pro quo. Right. Oh, okay. Alderman Weigel. I'm with Alderman Chaplesky on the 100% <coughs> story. I'd agree that every other business pays the school district, you know, and the county. I think of a typical nonprofit, and I, I think that maybe that their members might be using county <coughs> as transit. So that argues for them paying the county portion. Um, also, any physical structure or piece of land is falls under the umbrella of impacts to MMSD. So, yeah, I, I'd be support, in support of paying the, if, when the opportunity presents itself, making a deal for 100%, sharing it with the other taxing entities. And, and then just for the people watching on TV, understand, we're not talking about all the existing churches and everything that's here already. This is just, just for potential new negotiations with potential do nonprofits relocating or locating within the city? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For what it's worth, I think on the 100%, you can make that argument that every taxing entity would be impacted, whether it's using transit. I mean, there are going to be county services too that that may be um, utilized by whatever development or whatever business this may be. So I, I think obviously the city is is first and foremost in schools, but I think of the taxing entities, you can make a very um, strong argument that, that every entity would be impacted and could be benefiting, or any business could be benefiting from any of the entities. Mr. Chair, the only thing I like at on the east end, that I can start from one end of the east end <coughs> all the way north, I mean I can go actually on Sunday, I can start maybe at 7 in the morning until about noon. I mean, I can go to different churches. And there's so many churches down there now, really. And some of them, you know, they never feel like they're sitting in dimes in Texas, you know. <laughs> I mean, I say it's a joke, you know. It's the only thing you like? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's all those years. I mean, the last 10 years, it is more church than I've ever seen before, you know, really. Well, I, I think we're all aware of the fact that, I know, you know, there's been a I'm big, kidding, you know? big ad advent of uh, storefront churches. Um, all over, not only West Dallas, all but over, yeah. all over the country. I mean, that's that's the way it is today. And, uh, and you know, I guess we have to either adapt to it and accept it, um, uh, and, and people, you know, have to realize that uh, these places are not paying taxes, and that it affects your personal <coughs> property taxes um, because of that. So, I think you you have your direction from uh, owning plus you have something else. Yeah, is this state law or federal law? State. State. It's just state law. Why well, can you start working with the state to change it? <coughs> well, that's, <laughs> that's a good yeah, idea, too. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to work, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think you have your direction. Yep, very good. Um, Item four, it's a discussion relative to the sale of seven and a half acre parcel of land located at 1706 South 68th Street. Um, do you want to do this in full session? Uh, or do you want to do yes, open so session? We, we, want to, we always want to do as much as we can in open session. Yep. And then at the, after this is completed, and then we have another issue that we want to talk about, South 7th Street. Right. We'll talk about that in public session. And we'll be complete of that discussion of public information then we'll go into closed session and discuss those two items. Okay, let's start with 68th Street. Uh, Patrick. Thank you, John. So 68th and Mitchell area, we created tax increment number 14 in 2014 to address the Milwaukee Ductile Foundry site. It was privately purchased and they salvaged it and during that process we decided that you know, we needed to acquire this property. Um, we, we bought the property in December of 16. To date, the tax increment district has around 2.6 million in debt. Um, we 
are in the process of buying Perfect Screw, and then um, we still have the 6771 mm -hmm. West National Building. We call it the White Building, and we're going to get into those properties here in a little bit. But it's, those are additional costs that we have within this TIF. When we created the TIF, we said we would have around a $4 million budget for acquisition, relocation, demolition, all, all those um, things, including offsite improvements. Just showing you the framework of that tax increment financing district. When we did our uh, development projection, we said around 120,000 square feet of industrial space, and then we did some commercial space. But the TIF base value is $1.3 million. Um, our goal was to try to get at least $12 million in, in, in value in this district. One of the reasons that warranted our involvement in this is that at that point we were trying to get the Presteel Tank development going, the 84th and Greenfield development going, the private owner said uh, they were thinking about moving their dismantling business to the site. We were very not receptive to that because if you look at the area of their site, there's a lot of stuff stored outside. It would have really impacted the neighborhood. Uh, then the next proposal that came in was mini storage, and there's been a, a rise of this. You saw some articles in the journal talking about mini storage and, and things like that, and not really the ideal type of thing to really transform a neighborhood or to attract the the tax base we wanted. We even approached a freezer business, but then if you look at a freezer, you have probably good tax base, but not many jobs, and you would have a building that would have solid elevations of no windows and freezer space. <coughs> that was going to that website. And then we received an industrial proposal. This is called Light Space Industrial. 82,500, it was by Sam Dickman um, to build an industrial building. This is 82,500 square feet, and you could probably construct this building based on that proposal for around $57 a square foot. So with that in mind, you would get around <coughs> costs around $5.3 million on 7.5 acres of land. Um, with that, there were some challenges economically. They've asked for a subsidy. They wanted the land for a dollar. Um, in order to meet market rate rents on, on that site. One comment about that is because it's <clears throat> off a major, a major drag, it's not as receptive to people driving by wanting to stop in or, or to use that facility, so it has diminished value. And that was the problem that we were struggling with, is trying to find somebody that wanted to build on that that did not need to be have a visible uh, major arterial. Yeah, it's not your typical industrial park when there's some of those in, in their construction. Etc. But it's not to say that that option could be off the table. We just wanted to show you that we could build any industrial building. It, it, there's a demand for it. It's out there. It just doesn't have the highest tax and maybe the highest use of the site. And usually it'll require some kind of a subsidy Correct. Uh, to induce somebody to get off the major thoroughfare and get on there. But we can get any kind of use, just about any kind of use you would want. So when we're looking at options, I want you to remember that, that uh, we're, uh, we're, we're not limited by that. So we looked at multifamily on this site, and when we were considering it, I mean, we were also trying to get multifamily started on 84th and Greenfield and, and by the farmer's market, and there's only so much absorption in the market. But if you were going to review that option, one of the examples that might be in play here would be what was built on 92nd and Mitchell across from the KC Hall, which is a fairly new development, 2.8 acres of land, 38 units. You can see what that assessed out at. If you were going to extrapolate what that could be on a seven and a half acre site, you could probably do around 101 units, get around 90,000 a unit, and around 9.2 million dollars in value. Just a quick point: want to point out is that the average value of those units is about 90,000 uh, dollars. The average value of the units for, like, for Mandel, for example, is 240,000 a unit. With that being said, I mean, we haven't really. Ex dived into the residential in this area. We don't know roads, we don't know how this would all lay out and things like that. Um, plus, we don't know if there's a demand for it in this we area. We bring this to your attention because there's a wide variety of options. How did that get there? Did you make this? Uh, wrong one. Yeah, I wasn't going to do <coughs> yeah. uh, those there. Something I, got moved on. We're going to talk about this in closed session, but that's okay. This this next one, whoops, where was I at? There. Uh, there's another option in that area uh, being circulated. There's a proposal 
to have a, a, a train station or a new commercial rail station that runs around the metro area in this particular area. It's more of a transit oriented development where they, they want to be able to fund the railroads uh, by fare passages, but also by development that's increasing the value of the surrounding areas that they'll be investing in. And, and in this particular case, they were looking at this particular site, uh, putting a train station uh, on the southern portion of the site, and then an office complex on the, the, the north side. I bring that to your attention. This is down the road a ways, but uh, everybody's going to say, why, why, why don't we wait to get something bigger? It's a legitimate reason, too. There, so there's, there isn't a bad decision as to how you go about wanting to deal with the land sale in the future. Uh, we're just trying to say there's lots of options. That, that concept hasn't left the station yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Yes. Uh, Not well said. <laughs> no, well said. <laughs> uh, the next uh, item, Mr. Chair, if we go to that, would be the discussion about the purchase and sale of the development agreement between the authority and Cobalt. Okay, that would be um, uh, the properties at, uh, and the tip on 70th and Washington Street. Yes. Uh, and uh, this is the Cobalt project that we're, we've been talking about for several months. We're created a TIF. We're still working to uh, uh, put a deal together, and we'll talk about that in full session and negotiation terms. But, Sean, if you could just give a brief overview of what we're, where we're at today. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, yeah, just a brief review of where we're at. Uh, this is part of uh, TIF 16, which you can see the borders of here, uh, along South 70th Street in uh, West Washington, uh, north of Greenfield Avenue. It basically comprises the sort of the uh, outdated uh, office building along uh, on the east side of South 70th Street, which the uh, sort of the pointer is on here, and then the uh, the school district buildings uh, on the west side of 70th MATC, and then the parking lots, uh, which consist of uh, ownership of both uh, the school district and MATC, and then uh, McKinley Park is a, a part of it as well. Um, the uh, so that is the TIF. That we uh, that has been created and, and approved. Um, it was based on a vision uh, created by Cobalt Partners, which you, you see on the other side of the screen, for basically taking this you know outdated uh, office building and turn it into a modern corporate office park. Uh, anchored by uh, Phase One would be what you see here is a, a hotel and then just two you know two conceptual modern office buildings with sort of shared space in between, uh, like you'd see on a modern campus today. Uh, the other great part of it is it takes these school district buildings and privatizes them, which gets them on the tax rolls. As soon as that, that sale would take place to Cobalt, uh, you'd have uh, you know $7 million uh, ta uh, taxable value immediately on the tax rolls. Um, so that's basically, f you know, phase one is, uh, uh, this is just the, brief uh, vision of, of sort of, of what Cobalt brought to us, which is, uh, this is 70th Street, east side of 70th, uh, mm -hmm. up to 300 square feet of office space would be phase, you know, phase two, uh, putting in the hotel, so you can see the office, the potential offices conceptually, uh, the initial hotel, which would be the first thing that was done after the 70th Street office building was torn down. Um, and then this is the actual location of the, the school district buildings of which prior to tearing down the 70th Street building, they would make improvements to the building to allow for the tenants to move, which are currently in the East Office building, to move across to the school district building. Um, he, there's an agreement with all the tenants to move across, um, and, and, and they get that on the tax rolls. Um, and then you just see other sort of conceptual things that could happen as part of phase two uh, surrounding it. Um, What's been currently done, uh, the CDA and council have sort of bought into the vision and zoning map amendments and rezonings have been completed uh, to sort of follow Cobalt's vision for the area. So the zoning is in place, that just shows a hotel. And again, just if, if the Cobalt were to get to closing uh, on these properties, these are the things that would happen sort of in order. Tenant improvements would take place at the school district buildings. Uh, and then they would relocate the tenants from the East Office Building over to the school district, demolish the East Office Building, um, and then build the, the, the up to $10 million uh, hotel. Um, and then 
in order to do that, Cobalt is asking for for some things from us, and that's uh, what we would like to talk about in closed session. Anything more in closed session? Yeah. Please take notice that the Safety and Development Committee of the City of West Dallas will meet at approximately 6 p.m. or as soon thereafter as time permits on Thursday, October 11th, 2018 in room 128 City Hall, 7525 West Greenfield Avenue, West Dallas, Wisconsin, following the conclusion of consideration of the above portion of its regularly scheduled agenda to vote on a motion to convene in closed session at said time and place for discussion action relative to one discussion relative to the sale of 7.5 acre parcel of land located at 1706 South 68th Street, 68th and Mitchell, and two, discussion relative to the purchase and sale and development agreement by and between the Community Development Authority of City of West Dallas and Cobalt Partners, LLC, for development within TIF 16, South 70th and Washington Street, Corporate Office Order Plan, and to take such further action as may be necessary and appropriate with respect to such matters. Second. Second. All person right here. Aye. 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 Aye.